In today's class, we'll be talking about microcontrollers. Uh, we'll be talking about the internal structure so that uh, you understand uh, basically what is inside, what the components are in the microcontroller. And uh, then we'll be talking also about uh, peripherals that uh, you will find in a typical microcontroller. Uh, those peripherals uh, can be present either inside of a microcontroller or they can be connected externally as uh, some external integrated circuits. Uh, this will not be a very detailed explanation about microcontrollers. It is supposed to be only a basic introduction into the structure so that we understand what components are in the chip. So let's take a look uh, on a typical structure of a microcontroller. Uh, first of all, let me explain what is uh, the difference between a microcontroller and a microprocessor. So in this picture, you can see the block diagram of a microcontroller. So a microcontroller is a device that has a microprocessor plus other peripherals. So the microprocessor is doing the calculation. It is the basic unit that is uh, doing all the calculations, all the movements of data between different memories. And uh, when it is embedded with other peripherals, it is called a microcontroller. Today, you can find both on the market. You can find microprocessors as a single chip, and then you can find a microcontroller also in one chip. So inside of a microcontroller, we see the microprocessor. This will be what we will be discussing today. Uh, we will, so we will see in more detail a little bit later what is inside of this microprocessor. Uh, but we can see that we have also other peripherals around. Uh, we need some inputs. So here we can have some additional blocks that uh, allow us uh, to read in some data. Those inputs will be digital inputs. So one of the peripherals that we will discuss today will be also about the inputs. So this is the digital input that we can see here. The microprocessor will process this data, will calculate, for example, some control algorithm, uh, will calculate uh, what should it do based on some internal algorithm that's inside. And then we'll need some output. So the block called output in this figure is uh, representing also the digital output signals. And we will see also the structure of those outputs a little bit later. Uh, in the real world, we don't have only digital signals. So uh, very often we read in uh, some analog signals and we need this data to be processed uh, by the microprocessor. So for this reason, we have here an AD converter. So this converter converts from the analog signal to a digital signal. And again, today we'll discuss a few topologies that uh, are used for AD converters. Uh, it's not shown in this block diagram, but of course, uh, very often we need uh, also a conversion from digital to analog. So a microcontroller may have also a DA converter. Sometimes have it internally in the chip, Sometimes uh, you need to connect an external DA converter if you really need it. Uh, here we have a quite important peripheral, a timer and a counter. Uh, it is a quite useful peripheral. This peripheral basically counts either external events when it is a counter or it will count an internal clock when it is called a timer. In both cases, the structure is similar. It is a logic circuit, as uh, we have seen uh, in a few previous lectures when we've been talking about uh, digital circuits. So basically it counts uh, how many rectangular pulses that you receive from 
uh, some external input. This is the case of a counter. So you can imagine that, uh, for example, you're building an application that needs to count cars on the road. Then uh, you will have some sensor that will detect the cars passing. And this signal will be most likely a digital signal. It will be mm, zero or one when the car is passing. And then the microprocessor will count this signal. So you feed in an external signal, which will look like this, a rectangular wave. And uh, the counter will give you the count. The microprocessor typically has access to this counter through uh, an internal memory space that we will call registers. And uh, it can, for example, reset the counter. Uh, it can set its properties such as uh, division factors. It can uh, set, uh, for example, the, the speed, if it's a timer, uh, with which the, the timer will work. Uh, it can, for example, read the numbers that uh, are present in the registers of the counter. So in terms of uh, communication between the microprocessor and the peripheral, this uh, communication is uh, going in both ways. You can see that, for example, in the case of output and input, this is typically one way only. So the microprocessor reads in some data. This data is going into the microprocessor one way. Then if the microprocessor needs to set some output to zero or one, it will send this signal to the output, output block, uh, which will uh, handle this communication. Uh, regarding the input and output blocks, uh, today almost all microprocessors have uh, the input and output block as a uh, one block. It means that uh, you have some pins that uh, may be used either as inputs or output. And uh, by changing an internal configuration in the memory in some registers, settings, then uh, you may say that this pin will be an input and this pin will be an output. Uh, the same is true also for those other peripherals. Uh, on some microprocessors you have dedicated pins, for example for AD converters or for a counter. In uh, some other cases, which are more common, uh, the, those pins are shared with uh, the other input and output pins. And uh, with the internal configuration, you can uh, configure what will be the input, what will be the output, what will be the input of an AD converter, what will be the input of a timer, and so forth. Now, what is the difference between a timer and counter? A counter counts external events. So, for example, some info from the sensor, uh, it can count uh, button presses and so on. A timer is a counter, but the signal that it counts, it's uh, coming from an internal oscillator. So uh, you have an internal oscillator or external oscillator. Anyway, it's a an circuit that runs automatically. This provides you a square wave signal with some known frequency. So this means that you know the period. Let's say delta T will be my period. And if I know the period, by counting the number of pulses, I can use this as a timer to count time. So in a typical microcontroller, the timer is uh, used to time specific events that should happen at a fixed interval. And one of the examples is uh, the AD conversion. Let's say you want to read in uh, an analog voltage with an AD converter and you need to read this voltage at a fixed sampling frequency. So let's say one kilohertz. So in this case, uh, you can set the timer in such a way that it will time the AD converter so that every one millisecond, so one kilohertz sampling frequency, it will read in a new sample. And then you are sure that these samples, they come in at a specific sampling rate that you want and that you can apply your control algorithm that you have in the microprocessor. 
So the timer is uh, a very frequently used peripheral because it allows you to remove the load, the counting from the microprocessor itself. And uh, this counting of time can be made in hardware in the timer itself. Another use of the timer is also to time the functionality of uh, your code in the microprocessor. Uh, we'll be talking about it uh, also a little bit and it is related with this block that's called interrupt logic. Uh, first of all, let's say how can I use the timer. Uh, let's imagine that you have a control algorithm. You're reading in some data from the AD converter. It can be some temperature, for example, that you read uh, from a temperature sensor. Uh, then you have a control algorithm that uh, is designed to work at a specific sampling rate. For example, let's say 100 times per second. And then you need to output some, some number. So let's say that you are uh, controlling a temperature in a room. So in the AD converter, you read the temperature from your sensor. You convert it to the number. Then the microprocessor will uh, calculate the control algorithm and the output will be a digital signal that is uh, controlling a heater. So if it, there is too, it's too cold in the room, I will turn the heater on. If, uh, it's, uh, if it's, uh, not the, the, near the set point, then, uh, it's okay. I will not turn the heater on. And, uh, most, uh, control algorithms, are designed uh, to work uh, at some specific sampling frequency. So what you can do is that you can turn on the timer so that uh, it will in sort of wake up your microcontroller at uh, those specific sampling times, for example, 100 times per second. Then you will read in your result from the AD converter. You will apply the control algorithm in the microprocessor and then you will output your signal. And then your whole device goes to sleep mode because it will perform this calculation in a few microseconds. And uh, until the next sample time, it uh, can save energy and does not need to do anything. Or it can do something else. It can control, uh, for example, the human machine interface. It can send some data to the display. Anyway, some structure of the program that uh, is not vital for the control algorithm and that uh, does not need to be run at uh, a specific sampling frequency. And uh, now I'm coming to the block here, uh, interrupt logic. This is very closely related to the timer and to the functionality of uh, the microcontroller. Uh, what does it mean interrupt? Uh, imagine for example, that uh, you are building a controller for a car and uh, that uh, the controller will control the combustion engine, it will control the brakes, uh, it will control the radio, it will control some entertainment system in the car. Uh, if you look on the structure of the tasks that I have just named, uh, it is clear that there will be some tasks that are vital such as brakes, for example, and uh, some other tasks that are not vital at all, such as the radio or the entertainment system. So uh, we need some priority for different uh, events. For example, if I want to apply the brakes, the microprocessor needs to stop whatever it's doing and uh, run the code that is applying the brakes. So uh, in a microcontroller we will find a dedicated piece of uh, hardware that is called interrupt logic. It means that uh, the microcontroller runs code when there is an interrupt event it will interrupt the running of the main code it will jump to the interrupt service routine that is for this specific event and then it will start immediately. So for example, uh, the microprocessor will control your radio, will play you some video and so on. 
but uh, as soon as you have some important interrupt input such as the brakes or airbag or whatever then it will interrupt this structure of course you don't need to have the same microprocessor doing all this stuff there will be most likely one microprocessor dedicated just for the time critical stuff but this is uh, just to uh, to uh, describe you the structure and why do we need interrupt logic and uh, the interrupts can be coming from the external pins so it can be an external event such as a button press or some end switch for example it can come from at different sensors and uh, it can come also from AD converters counters or timers so one of the inputs for interrupts in typical microprocessors is coming from the timer so what you can do is that uh, you can uh, configure the microprocessor in such a way that every specific sample time let's say for example one millisecond uh, there will be an interrupt from the timer you will run your control algorithm within this uh, interrupt service routine and then you will leave the microprocessor to do whatever it needs to do and this is a typical structure of an embedded code it, uh, it is specifically timed with a timer it reads in some data from some analog input or from some digital input it then runs the code and then performs some outputs and uh, when it's freely available for other tasks it can run for example the display control or, or button control in the remaining of the time now we have two remaining blocks in our block diagram we see that here there is a program memory and uh, we have a data memory now again this is typical for embedded microcontrollers because uh, you have uh, a specific memory space where you can store your code and then you have some other space where you can save your data uh, there are effectively two architectures we'll see that on the next slide where we can also see that this memory space is combined so let's now see the typical structure of uh, the memory spaces in different uh, architectures. Now, uh, one of the architectures is based is called von Neumann, and uh, the other one is called Harvard architecture. And uh, the difference is how is uh, the memory space connected to the processor. So in, you can see that in the von Neumann architecture. We have the microprocessor as one block here on the left and then we have one memory space where we have memory and data in uh, for in one chip for example and it communicates with uh, one bus the second architecture called harvard architecture is different it has a microprocessor here in the middle and uh, we have a program memory and a data memory that is separated so we have one bus for the data memory and one bus for the processor to communicate with the program memory now both architectures are used and uh, even uh, some let's say combination is, is uh, used quite often uh, you can see here that we have uh, some data bus and it can it needs to say what I'm reading from the memory what is my number that I read so this goes typically through the data bus and then I need also to uh, say where I'm reading from so uh, typically you need a data bus an address bus and some additional control signals as well so the advantage of the von Neumann architecture is that you have just one data bus so you don't need as many pins as uh, with the hardware architecture on the other hand with the hardware architecture you have an independent bus for the program memory and for the data memory 
So this is a, a faster arrangement because you can read in the program and you can read in the data basically at the same time. But today's microcontrollers, they use something in between. So uh, they use both advantages. So you don't have uh, so many signals. So typically you have uh, the address bus, a data bus, and uh, then you have some control signals that tell you if you are reading uh, from the data memory or if you are reading from the program memory. Um, today's microprocessors or microcontrollers, I should say, uh, they typically have uh, some program memory embedded directly in the integrated circuit, a few kilobytes or a few megabytes, and uh, the same is for the data memory. So uh, you can have few kilobytes or even f just few bytes of data memory on the chip, or uh, you may have a uh, few hundred kilobytes. So uh, today there are many, many microprocessors that are available, I would say maybe thousands of them. Uh, and uh, if you're designing an application with a microcontroller, uh, you first need to think in very detailed way, uh, what are the requirements for your application? If I need a lot of memory, if I need a lot of inputs, what will be my power requirements? Uh, what are the speed requirements for my algorithm? And based on this uh, requirements, you can select a microprocessor or a microcontroller that uh, cost few cents. But uh, if you need some some really high end microprocessors with high power, high memory, it may be few tens of dollars or even hundreds of dollars. So uh, the the range of microcontrollers and microprocessors today is very very large. Uh, let's take a look now on the first peripherals and uh, we'll, be, we'll be starting with the outputs. So let's say that uh, now we already have some result of my control algorithm from the microprocessor and uh, now we'll be talking about this block, about the output block. Uh, this is a digital output block. So uh, the output of my pins here will be either logic 0 or logic 1. Uh, from previous lectures we know that this uh, logic level will be represented uh, by some voltage ranges. Uh, however, there are at least two different structures how I can uh, actually create a digital output. The first one that we will be talking about is called an open collector circuit. So this is my chip, like this, and uh, this is my pin that I want to control. The open collector circuit needs an external pull-up resistor. Well, not always, because uh, this pull-up resistor is sometimes also embedded in the structure of, of the microcontroller. So then you can connect it and you can uh, you can uh, omit this external pull-up resistor. Uh, but uh, in most cases, uh, well anyway, you can use an external pull-up resistor. Uh, the specific configuration of the open collector is done in such a way that inside of your chip, of your output, you have just a single transistor. So this is a single switch. And uh, here, this is my signal that I want to control. So I have uh, here either logic 1, like this, or I could have logic 0, like that. So when my transistor is disconnected, in other words, when Vn is uh, 0, then this transistor is disconnected, and uh, the voltage level on this uh, bus, on this wire, is uh, given by the voltage that I have here on the external pull-up. So for example, if I would have here 5 volts, then if this transistor is disconnected, then I would have 5 volts here as well. So in other words, the voltage levels when using an open collector are given by the external voltage that I have here 
and by the value of uh, this external resistor that I have here on the pull-up side. Here I have uh, the uh, bus that is connected over there and uh, this will be my other input for example to a different chip or different IC that will uh, be reading in the data uh, that are running on this wire. Now what happens if I want to send a logic zero on my signal? Uh, I need to close this transistor so this VN will be larger than the threshold voltage of my transistor, for example 5 volts as well. And this means that the transistor will act like a switch that is uh, currently closed. So this will be a switch like this. So uh, if I close this transistor here, I will have uh, the current that is flowing from my power supply voltage, from my 5 volts, through the pull-up resistor into ground. So this is my, my current. And uh, on the bus here, on the wire, I will have logic zero because this is effectively shorting this bus towards ground. Uh, now, uh, what are the advantages and uh, disadvantages of this open collector signal? You can see that it's a fairly simple connection. You need just one transistor in uh, this uh, configuration inside the chip and then you need one external pull-up resistor. Now the, the value of uh, your pull-up resistor actually depends on the current rating of your transistors here. And uh, it also depends on the speed that you desire uh, from the bus. Uh, the reason is that uh, in the ideal world, this would be great because uh, there is no capacitance whatever on the bus but in the real connection you can imagine that here we have some capacity between ground and between my wire so here this is a resistor this is a capacitor and therefore if i am going from zero to one i'm basically charging this capacitor through my resistor here. The, the typical value of pull-up resistors is uh, somewhere between 1 kilo ohm to let's say 10k, although this, this varies a lot. That depends on what whatever you want from your application, how fast should it be. But uh, we are charging this capacitor through a resistor. So we'll see a transient here. So if my signal uh, is uh, being displayed on the oscilloscope, here I will have time and here will be voltage on the capacitor, then I will see something like this, an exponential response. And the time constant of this circuit is given by R times C. So here we can see that uh, the response rate will be a function of uh, the capacity and on the resistance. Uh, this capacity on this part of the bus is not only on the bus itself. It is also on the output of my IC and it is also on the input of my second IC that I have here. So uh, it's not just the capacity of my wires but it's also the input and output capacitance of my ICs. If I want a faster communication, so if I want something like this, so faster response, right? Then uh, I basically have only one option. I can decrease the resistance that I am using here as a pull-up. So I can use, for example, 100 ohms. But on the other hand, the problem is when this uh, switch is on, then all this current is flowing through the transistor into ground. So I cannot choose uh, a too small pull-up resistor, for example, one ohm, because then the current flowing through this transistor would be very large and uh, would uh, destroy this transistor. Now, microcontrollers typically 
have uh, the current that they can uh, sink or source from its pins equal to few tens of milliamps. So let's say 10 milliamps, 20 milliamps, maybe 50 milliamps. So uh, I need to look into the data sheet to see what is the actual current that I can pass through this transistor uh, continuously uh, without uh, destroying. So the disadvantage of the open collector circuit is uh, that it's uh, fairly slow. Moreover, uh, the difference between turn on and turn off is visible also in this circuit. Why? Uh, if I am going from 0 to 1, I'm charging this capacitor through an external pull-up resistor, which is few kilo ohms. But uh, if I am going from 1 to 0, so if I have this switch initially open and then I close it, then I'm discharging this capacitor like that. But now you see that there is no resistor between the capacitor and between the transistor itself. So I'm discharging the capacitor directly. And uh, the only way, the only resistance that will prevent this discharging is the resistance of the switch itself, which is very small. So uh, when you are going from 1 to 0, then this rate, this transition will be much faster. Well, not like this, but uh, it's going back in time, but like this. And uh, it will be much faster because you have now also an RC circuit, but your R in this discharge event is the R of uh, your transistor. Uh, now, what are the advantages of this open collector circuit? Now, the advantage is uh, that it's uh, very safe. It, it, it cannot happen that uh, there will be a short connection on the bus. You can connect multiple devices on the same wire. So if this would be the same device, well, we, we would have, for example, two outputs, then uh, we can uh, we can have those two outputs connected in parallel, and then we can have uh, one IC that will have that will read in the data. So uh, I can have the following configuration. This will be my output. This will be my output number two. So output uh, two and output one. This will be my my bus with a pull up resistor that I have uh, over there going to plus and R and then I will have some device that will read in the, the numbers. So uh, on this open collector circuit uh, we don't have any problem with uh, the collision because the worst thing that can happen is that uh, one of the devices will pull the, the, the current low and the current will flow for example like this then this device, the output one, cannot send the data, but we will not uh, damage the bus at all because this is exactly what it's designed to do. So one device can prevent the communication of other devices, but cannot physically destroy the bus by overcurrent. So this open collector circuit is uh, quite used and quite useful, and we'll see little bit later for example applications uh, where we can use it. Now the second type of uh, the output is called push-pull and in the push-pull output uh, we can uh, see that uh, now we have two transistors. Um, don't be confused by this picture it is showing the output with uh, MOSFET transistors and here it was uh, showing uh, with a bipolar transistor. It can be done, the, the open collector can be done very easily in the same way also with a MOSFET transistor. This is only because uh, this picture comes from a different source than, than this one. So in this case they have used a bi um, MOSFET transistors. In the case of a push-pull output we have two transistors and one transistor 
is uh, connected between my signal and ground. So this is my ground of my circuit. And the other transistor is connected between my signal and between plus of my power supply voltage. So for example, plus five volts like this. And uh, the, con the functionality I th think should be obvious. Now, if I want that uh, this wire, this output signal is uh, low, I will open this transistor. Now I will close this transistor so that it's grounding this uh, wire and I will open this transistor so that it's not connecting anything to plus five volts. So for logic low, for zero, this transistor is closed and this transistor is open. Now in, in our example, the output that we have is an LED. So uh, here is a resistor and an LED. So obviously if uh, I have zero here on my output, the LED will be off because uh, there is no voltage uh, on this serial connection. Now if I want that uh, the LED is on, I need to turn on this transistor M1 and turn off this transistor M2. Now you can see immediately what can be the problem. I need to control the transistor M1 and M2 in such a way that uh, they are never open at the same time. Because if this would happen, I would have a direct short circuit between plus and between ground. So this is handled internally by the control circuitry of those transistors. This is only the last stage of a, a more complicated circuit that controls the voltage on this gate and the voltage on this gate. If you want to control the external LED, as you can see here, you have basically two options. One is shown here on the left the LED is uh, connected uh, between the pin and ground and the other option is shown here on the right and we can see that uh, this LED this is uh, again plus 5 volts for example and this is also plus 5 volts the LED is connected between plus and my pin so if I want the LED to be on I need to turn on the transistor M4 so that the current can flow like this. So what, which option is basically better? Well, this depends on the current that uh, your microcontroller is able to source or sync. So you need to look into the data sheet and this is the current that is called uh, the sourcing current. So it's sourcing from the pin into an external load. And uh, this is the current that the pin can actually sync. So it's going from your pin into ground through this bottom transistor in the connection. And uh, some microprocessors have uh, the current sourcing and syncing the same. So then it's really up to what you need. Some others have uh, the sinking current a little bit larger than the sourcing current. For example, the sourcing current can be 20 milliamps and uh, the sinking current can be 50 milliamps. So in that case, uh, you would probably choose this configuration. Well, also, well it also depends on uh, the current that you need to, to turn on. For example, for an LED, you might need 20 milliamps. Uh, for a normal LED, if you have a low power LED, you may need something like 2 milliamps. And then it doesn't really matter which configuration you choose. It depends on, only on your priority. Uh, this push pull output can uh, send the data, ones and zeros, out. And they can be read in 
by some other devices. Uh, you can note here that uh, there is no external pull up or pull down. So uh, definitely uh, this communication will be faster because uh, if, uh, for example, here I would have uh, some uh, input of my IC, so it will go to an input and now we don't have the LED here, then this means that uh, we are just charging the capacitance here of my wires plus the capacitance of my inputs here. So the push-pull communication is definitely faster because the resistance that I have here is only the resistance of my switches, which is uh, fairly low compared to the values of uh, pull-ups in the open drain configuration. But on the other hand, if uh, I have a configuration where I have multiple devices sitting on the same bus, now this could be quite dangerous. So imagine now that this would be my bus, again with, without the LEDs. And this is one device, device one, and now this is device two. So now uh, what can happen is that uh, one device will turn on this transistor, will connect the bus to plus, let's say, five volts, and uh, the other device will turn on transistor M4 and will pull this bus low. So then you have immediately a short connection directly between plus and minus to your bus and you can very easily destroy both devices. So the push-pull output is uh, typically used only when you have uh, one transmitter like this and one receiver as the input. So it's not typically used in a bus configuration unless you uh, do very specific uh, protection circuitry that sits in between such as resistors or such as uh, software control uh, what can actually control the bus. On the other hand, as I said, it is much faster communication. Uh, now let's take a look on a typical example of a pin in a microprocessor that can be both input and output pin. Now this circuitry comes uh, directly from a data sheet of uh, a microprocessor. So we can see here this, uh, this link goes uh, to the data sheet. What we can see here? Uh, we can see the two transistors here. So this is the transistor that sits between the pin, which is here, and ground. And this transistor sits between the power supply voltage, called here VDD, and the pin itself. And this is my pin. The, the IC boundary is somewhere here. So this is inside of the IC. This pad is outside. Now obviously the control circuit that is here needs to make sure that those two transistors are never turned on at the same time. So uh, when this transistor is on, this has to be off. And when this transistor is on, this has to be off. So that we don't have the short connection between VDD and ground. Now this transistor, you can see that they call it weak now, this can represent the pull-up resistor. And there is a control signal that can turn on this weak pull-up. So, uh, you can either use an external pull-up resistor that you have here, VDD, on the bus. And uh, you can also use this internal pull-up resistor. Now, in this specific uh, CPU that uh, I have used as an example, this uh, weak uh, pull-up has uh, the value of uh, approximately 100k. So you can use it uh, if you need a fairly slow communication. On the other hand, it will if, even if you turn it on uh, and you have an external pull-up uh, of uh, let's say 1k, then it will not be a problem because uh, although those two resistors are in parallel, then uh, the, the final value will be very close to the 1k that you have here as external 
same. Uh, this is a typical structure and you can use it to do both open collector and uh, push-pull outputs. So uh, by configuring the internal registers in uh, the mem configuration memory of your CPU, you can say, okay, I want that this is a push-pull output. So this means that I will control both the upper and the lower transistor. On the other hand, I can say that this will be an open drain output. So here I will control only this bottom transistor and the control of this top transistor will be disabled. It will be permanently off so that uh, it will not uh, prevent the functionality of my, of my bus in the open drain mode. So this is a typical structure of today's microcontrollers. You can choose if it should be open drain or if it should be push pull. It is typically done uh, when you initialize your CPU directly from the start by writing some values into specific registers. Now due to safety reasons, uh, the microprocessor will start in the open drain mode. So uh, this is the starting mode, the open collector mode. And uh, then you need to specifically say that this input will be a push-pull output. This pin will be a push-pull output. Uh, because if you start in the open collector output, even if uh, you leave this transistor on, nothing will basically happen. You will have the state on, the, on your bus defined by your pull-ups that are in the circuit. Now there is one last block uh, in this circuit that we did not cover so far. And this is this part of the circuit, the input. So a typical pin in today's microprocessors has a block that allows you to read back the values that you have actually on the pin. So if you want to use this pin that you have here as an input, you configure the transistor in such a way that this is off, this is off, and eventually this is off as, as well. And you are reading in the input through an input buffer. This is called an input buffer. Uh, if then you want to switch the pin to the output, you disable the input buffer with again by writing some uh, configuration into your registers and you configure this as the inputs output sorry uh, if this is used as an input then what you can do for example is that uh, let's say I, we want to read in a button so here I will have a, a pull-up resistor going connected to plus this will go into my to my pad and here I will have a switch and this will go to round so now it's an input. Now, if my switch is not pressed, then I have plus, let's say five volts here on my pin, then I have plus five volts on my bus, and I can read the plus five volts into the input buffer. So I know that the button is not pressed. Now, if I press the button, this will pull down my bus, and uh, I will read logic zero in the input buffer. So like this, you can use the pin as an input. Now, this is the typical configuration, how you connect switches to a microprocessor. So you have a fixed pull-up, let's say 1K, for example, or 10K. And uh, then you have an input switch like this, connecting this to round. OK, uh, so uh, let's see how we can actually connect the input signal to a microprocessor. So this is an example circuit uh, where we see a PIC microprocessor. It's one of the families that, uh, that you, you can use for your applications, one of the, let's say, low cost uh, uh, families. We can see the, the pinout. We can see that uh, we have different uh, input pins. And uh, in this particular application, we'll be using just uh, one input pin to read some external events. 
So this is this pane that uh, I will be using in my application. Uh, by the way, this crystal that is here on the right, that this is providing the uh, clock for the microcontroller. So you can see 4 megahertz is basically giving me how fast the microprocessor can actually run. And uh, very often in uh, microcontroller applications, you need some uh, insulation between your inputs and uh, your microprocessor. And the insulation can be done with uh, optocouplers. Now we've been talking about optocouplers a few weeks ago when we've been dealing with uh, semiconductors. And uh, hence you know that an optocoupler is a connection of uh, an LED plus a phototransistor. And what the optocoupler is doing is that it can insulate the input circuitry, which is here on the left, from the circuitry that we have here on my right side. It can also insulate it uh, from different voltages. You can note here that uh, on the left side, my uh, voltage is 12 volts. So this part of the application runs on 12 volts. But this part, the microcontroller part, runs on 5 volts. Plus this is the isolation boundary. And I have a complete insulation between this side and between this side. So how is, is this application working? Let's imagine that here I will have a switch or some other input. So for example, a switch. So let's say this will be my switch like this and this will go to ground and uh, now this operates on 12 volts. If I turn the switch on the current will flow like this in the circuit. The current flows through the LED here so uh, the LED is on. Now this is typically an infrared LED and this LED will produce the infrared light it will hit the phototransistor and this phototransistor will act as a switch. So this will be on. The current will flow like this in my circuit. You can see that this is a pull up from five volts like that. And now if this transistor is on, then this is pulling down my pin that I have connected to my microcontroller. So when my transistor is on, I have here logic zero and I can read that uh, with my input uh, of my microcontroller. Now on the other hand, if uh, this switch is off, so if it is uh, like this, there is no current flowing through the LED in the optocoupler. This transistor is off. So there is no current flowing like this, so this is zero. And here, due to my external pull-up 10K, I have five volts connected to my input pins. So this is representing logic one. So you can see that this circuit basically is uh, insulating the inputs on 12 volts voltage levels from my five volts that I have here on uh, my microprocessor side and it still transfers the useful information about the signal that is incoming to my input pins. So this is a quite useful circuit uh, for optocouplers and uh, if you're working with microprocessors, microcontrollers in general, it is always a very good idea to insulate this also uh, with an optocoupler. Uh, another reason why to use this insulation is that uh, you prevent uh, the destruction of your microprocessor, which might be quite expensive, from uh, over, over voltage. For example, if uh, you have an electrostatic discharge, this will be some, some keyboard, for example, someone will touch it and uh, he's ch charged, his body is charged, this can be easily a few kilovolts. 
then uh, you're not connecting this high voltage directly to your microprocessor pins, but to your optocoupler. So the worst case scenario is that you destroy an optocoupler, which uh, will be fairly inexpensive, and uh, you protect uh, your microcontroller from this uh, destruction. So this is the input side. Now let's take a look on how we can actually use the optocoupler on the output as well. And again, it's a, a fairly good idea uh, to use optocouplers because uh, they insulate the both sides, but uh, they can also protect uh, the sensitive part of your CPU from destruction. So here we can see a different uh, CPU from the family 89. This was uh, made by Intel, uh, but uh, this uh, circuit can be used uh, for any kind of microcontroller. Now what we can see here is uh, the optocoupler again. And here we have some uh, circuitry on the output of my CPU. And here I have some other circuitry on the output of my optocoupler. So how is this working? This is connected to 5 volts. And uh, when I will have logic 0 here on my output, there will be a current flowing like this. Now the current is limited by this uh, resistor R1, which uh, is 200 ohms in this specific application. Uh, by the way, you can see here that uh, they are using a buffer, so 74LS07, it's a, it's a buffer circuit, a gate, and uh, they are connecting this to this uh, microprocessor uh, port 1.0. Now the reason for this is that uh, most likely for this application the sinking current of this pin is not enough so that they needed to use a buffer. Now if uh, the sink current of your CPU would be few milliamps, maybe 10, 20 milliamps, you could connect it directly from the autocoupler like this to your CPU pin. But here they have used a buffer to uh, sink a larger current from the LED. So when this is flowing, when there is a current like this, typically 10, 20 milliamps, now this LED produces infrared light and this hits this phototransistor that we have in, in here. This phototransistor is on, it will close the circuit. Again, here we have a pull-up resistor, you know, 3K. And uh, this will be my output signal. And again, this is a buffer. But note now that this is an inverting buffer. So uh, when there is logic 1 here, there will be logic 0. And when there is logic 0, there will be logic 1 on this output. Anyway, you don't need that. It really depends on your configuration if you can use the inverted info or, or not. Uh, so again, the, the advantage of this is that uh, you can insulate your microprocessor part, which is here, with the insulation boundary, and uh, here is your output side. This output side can even work with different voltages, so this does not have to be necessarily 5 volts, it can be, for example, 12 volts, another uh, quite uh, typical uh, voltage level. And uh, if uh, there is a problem, if uh, you have, uh, for example, an electrostatic discharge on this on this output, then the voltage is going like this, but it cannot travel backwards through this optocoupler, and uh, this part of the CPU stays protected from electrostatic discharge. Uh, the same is also true for electromagnetic interference, even if it can enter this input pin, uh, through this optical insulation barrier, it is not connected electrically, uh, so uh, it will not go inside of uh, your sensitive circuit that you have here. Uh, let's take a look uh, on uh, how we can actually uh, use uh, the inputs even further. Now, in this picture, you can typically see what happens if you are using mechanical switches and uh, if you are connecting them directly to your microcontroller without any circuitry. 
So uh, we have a switch. You can see here that it's my switch. This is my pull-up resistor, and this is my power supply voltage VCC. So for example, let's say maybe five volts like that. Now, what happens typically in a mechanical switch is that we see some mechanical bouncing. So we can imagine that uh, here we have a switch like this. If I press the switch, then it will go into the second terminal, but here it will jump a little bit and uh, we will see that also in the electrical signal. So typically on the oscilloscope, it looks like this. Uh, you have first a very good high level, then you turn on the switch, then this is the bouncing itself, you can see the voltage is bouncing back and forth, and then we have a good connection to the ground. And this bouncing is a problem, because for example, if I was uh, going to count the button presses, now is this a one button press or is it several button presses? So therefore, uh, there are several ways how we can actually get rid of this bouncing problem. But one way is that uh, you detect this first transition. Then you wait some specific amount of time. So let's call it delta T. And only after this time has elapsed, you can uh, continue in reading your input signal. So you can do this in software. You connect such a simple connection externally. This will go to your microcontroller. And in software, you use the interrupt logic. You start an interrupt when you have a falling edge. You wait for a specific amount of time few milliseconds for example and then you continue in reading the inputs uh, so for example you can detect when it's going back high like this so this is how to get rid of the bouncing in software uh, you can do this also uh, in hardware as well uh, and that's that's what you can see here uh, in uh, the circuit in the circuit on screen uh, now note please that this circuit now uh, also has uh, other features as well such as uh, ESD protection. The basic debouncing circuitry is uh, only this part of the circuit. Now this is called a Schmidt trigger. It is a gate which has hysteresis on the input. So this is this symbol that you can see here. So what happens is that uh, the output will go low or high only if I'm above or below a specific threshold, but also if uh, I have uh, maintained the, the good uh, direction of the voltage change. So if we would plot the transfer characteristic of this gate, now let's, let's say this would be an inverter, uh, then this will be my input voltage Vn, and this would be my output voltage V out. Then it typically looks like this. You have, uh, you're increasing the input voltage, nothing happens. Then you have something like this, a transition. So this is when you're going upwards with the voltage. But if you're going, if you're decreasing Vn, it goes like this. And then goes, oh, sorry, it goes like this. And then it uh, has logic zero. So this is when you're decreasing the input voltage this is when you're increasing the voltage and in this threshold that's uh, where you can uh, get rid of uh, the bouncing that you have on the on the buttons uh, now you can know that uh, basically this circuit is exactly the same like uh, we can see here on the screen it's basically a switch plus a pull-up resistor so this is my pull-up resistor that I have here plus this one of course but and this is my switch but I have additional circuitry that is uh, producing uh, protection now this is uh, the first layer of ESD protection so it is a circuit uh, like a Zener diode or Transil whatever ESD protection diode 
that is sitting directly on the switch. So this is ESD protection. Now this R and C, this forms a filter. This is an RC filter. So uh, this is R and this is C. So even if I have uh, a transition like this on my input signal, this is uh, voltage and this is time, then here on this node in my circuit, I will have a first order response. So it will look like this an exponential curve. So this is the voltage on the transistor, on the capacitor. And uh, this will be, be one well, first layer of uh, the filter for debouncing. Here we have uh, over voltage protection. When uh, the input voltage would be larger than the VCC, then this uh, will be uh, clamped by the center diode like that. And this is again a more over voltage protection. So this is a typical input uh, that you find in microprocessor systems. You do not connect directly your switches into the microprocessor, but you have uh, many more layers of filtering and uh, ESD protections and over voltage protections to protect uh, your microcontrollers. Okay, now uh, we are uh, getting uh, to the end and uh, we will see a few examples of uh, digital to analog and then analog to digital converters. So now we understand how we can connect the microprocessor when we want to use digital signals. But uh, the, we, in some cases, well, many, many, many cases, uh, we also need to produce an analog signal uh, from a microprocessor. Now, what you can see here on this screen, this is an example of uh, a digital to analog converter. So the input is here. This is my input. This is a number. And in order to make it simpler, uh, I have chosen a 4-bit DA converter. So this is my 4-bit number. Of course, in the real world, this would be likely an 8-bit number or 16-bit number or 24, 32, whatever precision you actually require. And the output signal, in my case, is a voltage. So, for example, this could be a circuit that uh, takes in some sampled data in a microprocessor. This could be, for example, a music or video signal, or it could be some controller signal, and produces an analog voltage that I can connect to a speaker, I could connect it uh, to a screen, I could connect it to some, some display to, to show what is it, what, what voltage it is. So let's say, let's see how this circuit actually works. Uh, now this is uh, an operation amplifier. We have uh, been talking about operation amplifiers a lot in the previous classes. And uh, this is an inverting operation amplifier because our signal is going to the inverting input. So the voltage will definitely be negative if this uh, input signal is positive. And uh, it's an amplifier. So the gain of my amplifier will be given by the resistor in the feedback, which here is called R3, and the resistor here between the inverting input and the useful signal. So let's say now that uh, I will just uh, consider one bit that I have in my connection. So let's say, for example, this, uh, this bit, uh, what I will consider. The other ones, uh, for now, let's uh, just uh, erase them and uh, we'll not use them right now. So here I have logic 1. Let's say that this logic 1 is represented by 5 volts, like that. And now we want to calculate what is the actual output voltage of my connection. So I know that 5 volts is on the input. Uh, we remember the formula for this inverting amplifier and uh, it is like this. V out is equal to minus, because this is an inverting connection, 
Vn, which is 5 volts, so 5 volts times, and now the resistor in feedback, which is 10k, over the resistance in, in here, which is uh, 1.25k. So from this we could calculate what is my actual value of the output voltage that corresponds to this uh, to this bit. Now if you connect uh, an operation amplifier like this, it will be, be working like a summing amplifier. And you can see that uh, here we have different values of uh, our resistors. And it's not a random value of my resistor, we can see that uh, the following value is always doubled of the previous one. So here I had 1.25k, here is 2.5k, 5k, 10k, and eventually so on. So uh, it means that uh, those uh, values of my resistors are weighted. Now. Uh, what will be the largest contribution of my bits? You can see that here it's given by this part of my equation. The, the input voltage is always the same, but this part is giving me the gain. So if I have 10k divided by 1.25k, now this will be the largest contribution, and this means that this will be the most significant bit, or MSB. So MSB will change the output voltage with the largest step. And on the other hand, here, this will be LSB, because uh, then I have 10k over 10k, which is 1, and uh, the gain will be only 1 here. So the least significant bit is this one, and it will change in the smallest step the output voltage. Now you can uh, combine all those bits together and that's what you can see here in this equation. So uh, the MSB is this one, LSB is this one, and here you can see that uh, I multiply, this is basically, well, it's a 4-bit converter, so this represents 1, this represents 2, this represents 4, and this represents 8. So uh, this is the decimal combination, so it's 13 in decimal, and uh, the resistors in this uh, configuration are, are calculated in such a way that this will represent 13 volts. But this really depends on uh, what voltage do you need on the input. It does not have to be this, the same number uh, in, in volts as the number in, in decimal that we have here. Now, as I said, this is only a 4-bit example. Uh, such a 4-bit converter would not be very practical because the, the voltage steps will be very high so typically you can find DA converters that have uh, 12 bits or they have 8 bits, they have 16 bits and so on. The disadvantage of this uh, DA converter type is that uh, you have weighted this resistor values. Uh, in other words you need uh, a lot of uh, very precise resistors. You can see here we have 10k, we have 5k, 2.5k, and uh, you have 1.25k, and so on. So uh, if you uh, were to create a 16-bit resistor, you would need 16 different very accurate resistor values here on the inputs. So uh, for a larger number of bits, this can be quite inconvenient. For this reason, there is a different topology of a DA converter uh, that uh, gets rid of this problem. And this topology is called an R2R ladder DAC. It again uses uh, an operation amplifier. So this configuration is quite similar. But what is different is uh, here that we have on the inputs. You can now see that uh, I need uh, only two values of my resistors. I need some value, let's call it R, and I need double R. So for example, if this would be 10K, let's say, 
then this would be 20k. And in practical configuration, you can see 2R, it's nothing else than two resistors connected in series. So we, you really need uh, just one accurate value of R, and then you use it either once or you use it twice in series. Now what is different is that those switches are switches that connect uh, the signal between ground, which is here, and between some reference voltage. So in this diagram, this switch was either on or off like this. So this was a single pole switch, but uh, for the R to R leather DAC, you need a double pole switch. So it can switch between some voltage, some input and ground like that. Now, how is this working? Uh, let's imagine that uh, this switch is connected to ground like that. So this this would represent me zero here. So what happens here? I have 2R and here I have 2R as well. Those two resistors are connected in parallel and 2R in parallel to 2R will give me resistance of R. Now we have R plus R which gives me again 2R and so forth. So if I for example now connect this to ground again which would be which would be 0 then I would have 2R in parallel to 2R which gives me R plus R gives me again 2R and so on. Uh, now, uh, let's say that I will have one switch, for example, this one, that will connect, be connected to the reference voltage. Uh, so let's say that this is still, uh, this is still uh, connected to zero, and that here I have uh, one again. So I have basically propagated this 2R all the way here which is, uh, this is again, again, 2R in parallel. So this is R plus R is 2R and 2R, 2R in parallel to 2R. This is R and plus 2R here. This is, so this is basically uh, 2R again. Uh, but now I have here this voltage, which is um, the reference voltage. And uh, I don't need to uses any specific value but uh, uh, just uh, let's say that this will be for example one volt like that uh, and now I have one volt connected to my input here I have 2R that has propagated from the very bottom so this is 2R and uh, 2R and 2R here and you can see that this is basically a voltage divider and uh, that it divides the voltage into one half because here I have some voltage and I have two resistors of the same value so you can represent it like this this is some voltage this is some resistance uh, well in my case uh, it's 2R and uh, here it's connected again to 2R like this and ground. So this is my reference voltage and now I want to read in this uh, this voltage that I have here. So uh, I will have some voltage that I can calculate in advance in, uh, in, this in this node of my circuit and now this voltage gets amplified by my operation amplifier. So I will get uh, some output voltage that I have somewhere here. And I can calculate what this formula will be. Will not do that. It's not that important. The only important thing here is that uh, if I use this structure of uh, R to R, I basically need to use only two or one value of my resistor. So in terms of construction, this is a very very simple device. So we can find uh, those. Uh, 
DA converters uh, as uh, specific uh, ICs. Uh, you can build them as well uh, if you have a leather configuration or if you have a configuration like this uh, with uh, discrete components and uh, you can uh, connect them to your microprocessor. Uh, now at the end, let us uh, talk about uh, two AD converters. So we'll see how we can actually com convert the digital number in um, what that we need uh, from an analog value. So imagine that you want to read in some voltage. This voltage can correspond to a temperature, it can correspond to position, it can correspond to light that you have in the room and so on. And you want to read it in and you want to uh, do something with this uh, with this info in a digital way. Uh, the first uh, circuit that we will discuss is uh, called a flash ADC. It's also called a parallel ADC because uh, it uh, it works in parallel and uh, it is a very fast circuit. It is typically used uh, for fast signals such as video signals that uh, you need a very high sampling frequency. And this is the internal structure. Now it needs a lot of uh, operation amplifiers. So here we have a large array of operation amplifiers. Now the circuit that you have here as an example is an AD converter that works with three bits. This is only due uh, to the limited space on screen. Uh, I, of course a 3-bit AD converter would probably not be very useful but uh, for this type of converter uh, you need uh, a large number of uh, operation amplifiers. Now the, your analog input comes to one of uh, the inputs of the operation amplifiers. And note that uh, the operation amplifier now has no feedback. So it is operating as a comparator. So it's not operating as an amplifier, but it is operating as a comparator. And uh, the other input of uh, your op amp is coming from a voltage divider that uh, is providing reference voltages for the operation amplifiers. So you can see that here I have some reference voltage, some other reference voltage, some other reference voltage, and so on. And uh, this is a, a voltage divider that divides this reference voltage of 10 volts they have used in this picture by the amount of uh, resistance that we have here in the circuit. And uh, the operating amplifier compares the voltage reference with the specific uh, analog input. So if my analog input voltage is below my voltage reference, this is a fixed voltage, very accurate voltage, then this will give me some signal. If uh, my analog voltage is above the signal that I have on the reference, I will have uh, the outputs set to some voltage level. So for example, if uh, I would like to convert the voltage, let's say voltage like this, this would be voltage input and this would be time. What it, this circuit is doing is that uh, it uh, will basically split this interval into some uh, boxes, into some small intervals. And all those intervals that are falling below my voltage that means that uh, all those uh, outputs will be activated. So for example, this output activated, this output activated, this output activated, so there will be one, one, and one, and uh, all the other signals will have zeros. So this part of the circuit is giving you zeros and ones based on your analog input signal but this is not binary encoded. It is uh, necessary to have an additional encoder circuit 
it will produce uh, this as uh, a binary encoded circuit. So this is this encoder. And we can see that in our connection we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven comparators. And uh, this will give me a 3-bit signal, which will represent this input signal as uh, a binary encoded number. Now the advantage of this uh, type of AD converter is that it is very fast. So the sampling frequency can easily be a few megahertz or even more. And uh, therefore this structure is used uh, to sample fast signals such as video signals. On the other hand, we can see that we need a lot of uh, circuitry. For every level, we need one comparator. So for example, if I want to create an 8-bit converter, 8-bit, this means that this is 2 to the power of uh, 8, which is uh, 256. So I would need 256 AD converters and uh, uh, operation amplifiers. Now, if I would uh, like to have uh, this 16-bit converter, I would need to have 65,300 Uh, 50, uh, sorry, 365,535 converters op amps. So we need a real a lot of, uh, of op amps. So uh, those uh, flash uh, AD converters are typically made like uh, 8 bit converters. So they are fast, they are complicated, and expensive. Last type of AD converter that we will discuss is uh, having completely opposite properties. It will be slow, it will be simple, and it will be inexpensive. So the flash AD converter can be used for example for video signals. If you need it for a handheld voltmeter, you don't need the speed and then you can use the dual integration converter. So how is this working? We can see that we need only two operation amplifiers. Now this first operation amplifier operates as an integrating circuit and the second operating amplifier operates like a comparator. And uh, it's called dual integration because it's doing the integration twice. What we are integrating is uh, our unknown voltage VA, an analog voltage input, and uh, we are also integrating a known reference voltage. And note that uh, the reference voltage needs to have a different amp sign than uh, the analog input signal. And it's called dual integration because here we have a switch. We can control that switch with some uh, control circuitry, which is here. And uh, this uh, will switch between the unknown input voltage and the known reference voltage. So how is it working? Let's say that initially here this capacitor is discharged. Now this is an integrating circuit. So we know what this voltage will be. When we've been discussing uh, operation amplifiers, we have been deriving this uh, formula. So V out will be minus and now 1 over RC this is R and C here in the circuit. And now the time integral of uh, my voltage Vn dt. And this is from 0 to some value of t. So we can see that this voltage on the output will be the time integral of my input voltage. Of obviously plus uh, some Vc voltage, uh, which is the initial condition uh, for my capacitor. But let's say that initially now I 
am assuming that this is completely discharged. So now what is happening is that uh, I first connect my input switch to my unknown analog voltage. So I'm starting from zero. This voltage needs to be constant. And I'm assuming that, the, that VA is a constant value, so this is a constant. So I'm integrating a constant value. And the integral of the constant is a line. So the output voltage will be integrating like this in a linear way. And uh, we can see that uh, here it's VA, that's my value of the voltage, uh, basically over RC here, and this is minus, so there is, this is the line that's missing here. Uh, so we are integrating our unknown voltage. And we will integrate that for a specific amount of time, and we will call that T1. When T1 has elapsed, which is controlled by this uh, control circuit over there, we have reached some value that we will call Vs. This is the, the voltage that we have on the output of our integrator. Now, when T1 has elapsed, we will switch the Vref to, uh, we will switch this switch to integrate Vref. And uh, you can see that Vref has a different sign than Va. So it will integrate this voltage but since it has a different sign, it will change the voltage like this. Here we have increased the voltage to negative voltage. This is zero and, and this is minus. And uh, we will integrate back towards zero. Now we are integrating the reference voltage again over RC in our integrator. So this will be a linear de decrease of my voltage towards zero. But I'm now waiting until I reach this zero voltage level. And this is actually controlled by or verified by this uh, comparator. So this comparator is checking if my voltage is zero. If it's not, it keeps integrating. If it is zero, you can see that this will now change polarity if it's a little bit above zero. So I'm guarding this inter this time over there, and uh, therefore I'm counting what is uh, the time of uh, T2. Now, why is this useful? You can now see that, uh, for example, if my VA will be smaller than the one shown in this chart, now the slope here is VA over R times C. So if VA is smaller, it will integrate like that to a small value at the end and therefore if I then integrate Vref it will go like this and therefore T2 will be smaller. By the way those two lines are parallel. On the other hand if uh, my VA is larger I will integrate to a larger value and this means that uh, then I will have a larger value of T2. And this is uh, what this part of the circuit is doing. You can see the clock here. It is counting the number of clocks from some uh, clock source, like a crystal oscillator, for example. And uh, here is the counter. So this binary counter, this corresponds directly to the value that I have here as a digital output. So this is a fairly simple device. You require a very simple circuit only. Two op amps, one switch, resistor, capacitor, and some other logic circuits. So it's a fairly simple device. On the other hand, it is very slow because here it integrates T1, it integrates T2, and this can be 100 milliseconds, it can be 20 milliseconds, whatever. So typically, the dual integration AD converter 
is used in slow devices such as handheld multimeters where you just need like three four samples per second but on the other hand it's a very cheap device because you just need few components and uh, it has one more advantage uh, it can get rid of uh, disturbance that is power that is coming from the power network why well the reason is simple we we can get rid of uh, interference from the power network if we choose properly the value of uh, t1 the time when we integrate there i have said that i need that va is constant but unfortunately due to interference very often it will not be constant it will be changing but uh, if you choose the value of t1 to be equal to the period of your interference so 50 hertz is the most frequent interference coming from the power network in 50 hertz countries then uh, you have value of va some voltage that you want to convert plus some uh, interference so basically you will see something like this there is some interference it's changing so something like that but if you select that t1 is equal to some fixed uh, multiple of your interference period then you can see that here i have added the voltage but here i have removed it subtracted that again the same here same here same here and same here so uh, basically if the interference adds something it will subtract something here in this negative half wave of the period and uh, this uh, takes into account that uh, the most typical interference is coming from the power network it's a sine wave which has a known and fixed uh, frequency so the dual integration converter is slow it's inexpensive and it can get rid of uh, most but not all but most of uh, the interference that we have in the power network so we have seen two extremes uh, a dual integration which is slow but cheap and uh, the flash da converter which is fast but expensive